the Learning to Dive album, Norwegian Pop. I can understand, of course, the first question would be, why would you call it that when you're a Kiwi band, supposedly, or an act? But once you hear it, it doesn't sound like your typical, what you think of as New Zealand music. Uh, would you agree with that? Yeah, I agree. I think it's uh, it has its roots in another time, really. And, you know, I've spent a, lo a long time traveling around the world. And uh, it's kind of a, I suppose, a, kind of a remote album in some ways. You know, like, uh, you know, I, I've been traveling a lot, but not being based in any one place, really, for any length of time until the last year and a half. Right. So it, has, it does have some detachment. Another reviewer said it was detached. I kind of agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, but uh, yeah, Norwegian pop. I mean, you obviously know this. It was recorded in Norway and um, at the amazing uh, Ocean Sound Recordings, which is at the end of a fjord in right. Norway. Right. And right. I think it, it may be one of the more spectacular recording studios in the world. I'm sure it is. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, so that it, it was. It is kind of ironic to the name, um, you know, because the album is not poppy. Uh, there's a lot of serious themes and. Yeah. a lot of angst in there. Yep. Um, uh, but you know that the the, uh, the background, if you you know stylistically, the album sort of rests upon uh, post punk pop of the eighties. So that's kind of where the pop comes in. So uh, how did you find yourself in a fjord in Norway making the record? Well, uh, Greg Haver has been a friend of mine for a while, and huh? uh, on his Facebook page, he had some photos uh, of him recording another band. I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the band. It was like a a punk band and um and i just thought this looks incredible what an amazing place to create an album and at the time i was thinking of putting together an album coming back to music and uh putting together some uh, songs i had and uh just seemed obvious to, to do it there and uh what a great choice yeah it was just uh, it really was one of the most special couple of weeks of my life really <laughs> uh, really amazing how much does the location that you were in affect the sound that we hear on the record? To be honest, I, lo I love to say it affected it in a lot of ways, but really, right. you know, the songs, the songs came from another place, as I say. So it right. was really just the experience of being there uh, with a good bunch of people too, you know, a great bunch of people. Actually, you know, maybe there were, you know, some of the creativity that came through in terms of adding some of the layers may right. come from the location. Yeah. Okay, all righty. Um, and so where is the space that these songs are coming from then? Well, it's, uh, there are songs in the album that are obviously you know, quite, sound very personal. Right. But the songs aren't really about anyone in particular. I, I grab little bits of, of my life and experiences and things that I've read and put them together into the songs. Um, but, you know, there's some things, uh, there's some strongly felt themes in there. Uh, right. For example, Tainted, which is kind of an angry song. Uh, you know, I, I really, I'm very frustrated that there is a deflection of the global media away from what is a very dangerous situ situation building in terms of nuclear weapons, et cetera. Right. It seems like we've forgotten nuclear weapons. So that that is um, something that, you know, was very strongly felt. There's a couple of sort of, uh, sort of, I suppose, uh, faded love song type tracks on there and they're not about anyone in particular but uh, they're about like failed relationships there's actually another track which is a lot more positive um which i've left off the album uh and i'll release as a single it's just uh you know it didn't fit in because it's too positive right. <laughs> um, <laughs> um but that song uh the reason it really the real reason is it, it doesn't it's not 80s it's kind of got an early 90s vibe um and kind of ballading so it just didn't fit but it is, a, I think it's a good song. So that's going to come out with a video in oh, good. About six to eight weeks. Yeah. Right. Well, getting back to Tainted, I mean, you have a line in there about assassins proud to do their work and also a kind of a swipe at the media as well. How it's absurd. So what is your take on, on the media these days? Assassins proud to do their work. And we let it happen.
Well, for example, one of the things I noticed in America, I spent a lot of time in around, is that if you are a military contractor or from the military, you get preferential treatment wherever you go. Now that's yep. based on this idea that you know you're defending the country, etc. Right. You're a hero. Um, you're a hero. That's right. But in fact, you know, there's a lot of illegal wars that have gone on where people, you know, poor villages have been murdered right. by these people, etc. So um you know, that's where I kind of get this idea of the assassins and and the, the celebration of these assassins by the media, especially in the American media, uh, less so in places like New Zealand and things like that. But, uh, you know, there's a real jingoism in, uh, in UK and uh, USA media around the military. Right. Which caused you to be traveling around so much? You're just that kind of guy? Um, so I, yeah, I, um, I work in investment as well as being a musician. In fact, that's okay. kind of my main thing. So, um, you know, I've been working out of London or between London and Wellington for quite a few years. Um, and when things get back to normal, if they ever do, you know, <laughs> I will probably be doing kind of similar. Right. A lot more relaxed than I had been. Right. Uh, interesting. Now, I know you kind of, uh, kind of base your sound around, like you said, post-punk, early 80s. I'm assuming you're thinking of bands like Wire and Psychedelic Furs and that. But one that came to my mind, especially on I'll Smile, is Pink Floyd. Seasons change. Can lovers ever stay the game? A closed down venue. When the devil's playing. You know, I think Pink Floyd is everywhere in my music, but it's, <laughs> they're not someone I listen to a lot. You know, right. it's interesting. Right? But it is, it's everywhere. I mean, I think, I think all of us who create popular music can't ignore those influences. Right. Uh, but actually, if you listen to I'll Smile, if you know the Blue Nile, yep. that's kind of where I'm going with I'll Smile. Uh, okay. Yeah, so, you know, if you think about um, kind of the late 80s material from uh, the Blue Nile, it's, I'm trying to channel a little bit of that, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've talked to several people who have mentioned them as uh, kind of a stepping stone. So it, they may not have been the biggest band back then, but they made an impression. Oh, I, you know, uh, incredible band. And it's interesting, I, I, I show some of my younger colleagues those albums and they just go, oh, this is amazing. Especially I walk across the rooftops, I mean, which was the you know the first their first album really that right. uh, made them famous yeah yeah and uh, and uh, I'll smile is followed by high and dry which uh, also has kind of, is rather dark and Floydian but uh, there's also is there a sax in there is that what's happening. There is a sex. Uh, but who I'm you afraid to say, is you or somebody yeah, else? I'm afraid to say it's Tony Fingers. <laughs> Tony Fingers on the sex. So um, yeah, I, that, I was very proud of that uh, sex solo I played on a synthesizer. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Because I, cause I yeah, had a feeling, yeah. I, I mean, I've heard a lot of saxophone in my day, so I like yeah. to think that I can tell one from the other, but it sounds pretty good. Yeah, it's just the it, the sample is just a little smooth for a real sax, you know, but yeah. uh, it's a very good sample. It's from Native Instruments. Uh, yeah, so that song, uh, um, you can probably detect some kind of Roxy Music, Brian Ferry influences there as well. Right. Um, you know, I'm not consciously copying, um, but it just, you know, they're my influences and my background. And um, that song is is a mere culpa. So it's it really is it is kind of a personal apology for being a 50, 50 year old white male. Fair way, enough. <laughs> and uh, from the financial class, you know, because um, we have been direct beneficiaries of neoliberalism. Yep. And I believe neoliberalism has been a bit of a cancer on. On the planet to be honest and uh and it's really an apology for that but also kind of a personal apology for you know being me <laughs> and you know the way i've been 
and sort of interacted with the world as right. one of that class. Right, yeah. right, right. And I kind of have a note here. That to me, this that high and dry song feels like the centerpiece of the album. Do you look at it like that as well? It's interesting you say that because it kind of is to me. Yeah, it's a very, it's a, it's a, for me, it's quite a powerful song. Yeah, and it's also um, the longest track on the album, so that always helps. Yeah, it, it gets a bit yawny. I know. I'm sorry about that. No, but, no, no. Uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> well, it's interesting. It reminded me of, of Bowie, but not Bowie of the 80s. It actually reminded me of like Black Star Bowie, you know, the, the last album. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That's a nice thing to say. Yeah, <laughs> it is a bit, I suppose. <laughs> but I'm, I'm not saying I'm as good as Bowie at all. No, but, no. Uh, yeah, it's quite, yeah. I mean, it is a track of, of our time as well. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. So, and, and then the way I see it, there's like seven tracks, seven or eight tracks, and then edited versions of a couple is that part of the album too or is that just something i saw online yeah they're just i just left them in there you know um some of the extended versions of the tracks i prefer like promenade extended is my favorite track right. in the album in a way apart from maybe high and dry uh uh but we need to have radio edits and things like that so i've just left them all in there for people to listen to yeah yeah and the opening track is called stand on an ice flow and it, i mean it i saw the video which is Pretty cold, <laughs> frigid looking white glaciers, yeah. and, and definitely captures that feel. So, why did you want to start on an album with such a cold, forbidding kind of vibe? Yeah, it's a good question. I just, I just felt like the track fitted there stylistically. Uh -huh. It's not really thematically there for a reason. Right. Um, the track, it's track is about uh, an introvert's isolation and taking on and being hit by life's challenges and bouncing back from that. Uh, that you kind of get that in the video, hopefully. Yeah, because it's, it's almost still a struggle. It's yeah. an instru instrumental and it's kind of soothing, but then kind of has some tension building in it at the same time. Yeah, I, I deliberately embedded some tension in there. Yeah, it's it's kind of things get better, but not not quite right. Right, gotcha. And then you have some other people playing on. There's somebody named Andy Taylor. I assume it's not one of Duran Duran who's playing. No, no he, he's commonly mistaken for Andy Taylor from Duran Duran. He's not, um, but he's a great guitarist, a very lyrical guitarist. Great, bringing all sorts of stars to the table. He was brought in by uh, Greg Haber. Greg Havers used him previously. And, uh, so, was so what was Greg, how did Greg and you work together? Uh, so, I mean, he, Greg's a classic sort of producer. So he works at a high level and, okay. and he has a few kind of favorite engineers that he works with. And um, one of them is Clint Murphy, uh, who engineered the track. Right. Um, and so they, you know, it, the initial process was me working with Greg, coming up with the ideas Greg sat with them for a while and then basically came, came up with ideas to sort of manipulate the tracks or add a few things in, take a few things out. Um, you know, some of the tracks got shortened, which in retrospect, I'm glad we did. Right. Uh, you know, high and dry could have been longer, would you believe? But <laughs> that's all right. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, so that's how they we worked together there. Then um, in the studio, basically, it was about getting everything down and uh, I, I cannot believe Clint Murphy's work ethic. You know, right. I, I couldn't do it. I just could not do that. He was doing 16 hour days and, you know, it was full on. Um, I don't know. If it's, anyway, but uh, so he, him and Greg would work together. And I actually kind of stayed away from a lot of that interaction. Mm -hmm. um, so just let them get on with it uh, and did my bit. And then basically, in post-production, when we went to, uh, we did some initial mixes in Norway, but really the mixing was done at Modern World in Tetbury in Gloucestershire, right. in the UK. And it was Clint and I sitting down and basically going through and just rounding off the tracks, adding a few bits and things like that. So what was done at Roundhead? Uh, so that was other material I've done. So ah, Roundhead, okay. yeah. So that was for another project called ours. Which, okay. Uh, yeah. Because in the press release I got, there was three places listed and one of them was Roundhead, so. Oh, right, so it should say Pure Sound, actually. <laughs> so I've got my little studio. So Pure Sound is where I did a lot of the initial writing. Right. Um, and uh, then, then we took it offshore. Gotcha, gotcha. 
Now there's one other person uh, I wanted to, Al, Alba Rose. Alba Rose, is, this, is she a vocalist that's on the record? Yeah, so Alba Rose, I've been working with since uh, July 2018. She's uh -huh. a young vocalist. Um, kind of got to know each other through family. Um, she's obviously the different generation to me. And uh, we are actually now colleagues, so she works with me in the studio. Right. Uh, but she's got she's been in a band called Corduroy, uh, which has become quite popular in the Wellington sort of pub scene, club scene sort of thing. Yep. Uh, and uh, she's also got her own music coming through now. Uh, she's uh, put together a set. She's actually playing on Friday at uh, um, oh, what is it? The the, the brewery. Mm. Uh, it's a brewery place. Okay. Um, oh, Alla Tower. Uh, Paratog. Paratog. Oh, okay. Paratop Brewery place, yeah, uh, with Meraki, which is, uh, I think, a, a new signing by right. Gang. And so she's supporting there. So I don't know if you want to see her, she can see her there. But uh, great vocalist, very creative. Um, we work very well together in terms of, you know, rounding out the tracks. And things like right, that. right. And uh, so what happened on the, it was released on April 2nd, right? Yep, not April 1st. No, yeah, <laughs> April Fool's Day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What did, what did you do on the day to celebrate? Anything? Uh, nothing really, no. <laughs> Man. Um, it's all very subdued. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's just kind of a bit of a, bit of a relief to get it out, to be honest. Yeah. It's been a long, hard road to get it out. And um, there's been a background to this, which has been kind of unpleasant, which I can't really talk about. But um, it's really made the whole thing sort of difficult. Right. But that, you have to get it out. It's been, uh, it's, been a, it's just like, like a kind of a comfortable, good feeling to get it out. Yeah. Right, right. So have you been thinking about what you're going to do next then, once this is out? Yeah, I've got, I've got a lot of plans. So uh, I, obviously I talk, talk about this other single coming, which will kind yeah. of round off that. Yeah. I'm recording another EP with Greg in late June. Right. I'll be recording that in its entirety at the studio here. Right. And then um, I also have some new material for my sort of, actually my sort of main identity, which doesn't have a lot of material out there, but I see that as my main identity, which is Bravo Bernays. You right. Know, that's kind of my artistic identity. And uh, that's kind of retro lo-fi beats with a ramshackle neo soul sort of um, overlay to it. So quite different to this. And Very different, yeah. Probably more, yeah, more contemporary sounding, uh, although it's got lots of retro elements. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so that's, I'm looking forward to getting that out. Uh, I'm also looking to uh, build a live set around um, my DJ kind of equipment and things yep. like that. And uh, I'm planning a, quite a significant gig early next year where I'm hoping to both play trumpet, uh, electric violin and combine with a, a DJ set. Okay. Um, that's a big target at the moment. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> and, yeah. and because you have these two different entities, musical entities, do you find that you have to think about how fans of one will relate to the other one or are they totally separate things? I don't actually see them really interacting, to be honest. I <laughs> right. actually have three identities. So I have another one called Haikyo, which what is, is Japanese. Haikyo. Haikyo. Yep. H A I K Y O. Okay. Which is Japanese for ruin. And, um, you know, I, I don't want to steal someone's culture, but I, where I came from with that, that that identity is um, I have a lot of uh, ambient cinematic pieces that just didn't sit anywhere really. And right. they needed their own identity. And uh, they kind of, there's a lot of kind of ruin in them, <laughs> I suppose. And okay. uh, I got the idea after traveling through Japan a year and a half ago and saw so many buildings falling down in Japan, which is not what you think of in Japan, but with right. an aging population in Japan and all the young people the less young people that they were that, you know, so 20 years ago have all moved to the cities. So there's these houses that are just falling down everywhere um, all through the countryside in Japan. And, and it kind of resonated with me. And that kind of, I felt like I, like, I could link that with that identity. So I actually have an EP out from Haikyo, which has had very few listens. Um, and that's called Number One. So that's on Spotify as well. Um, okay. But those people who do listen to it, it's 13 kind of one minute tracks. Right. Those who listen to it, you know, Yep. Seem to enjoy it. Yeah. Cool. cool. So Norwegian pop, do you see that having a, a live version? Are, are you going to perform? I never say never, but not really. No. <laughs> I mean, it, would take, it would take a lot to do it well, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it would definitely have to have Greg Haver on drums. Right, right. 
good. He's been a busy guy um, lately. Played, I've seen him around quite a bit. So, sorry, what's that? I said he's been a busy guy lately. I've seen him around quite a bit. Yeah, playing. very. Focused. He's done incredible things to the New Zealand music industry. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. doing a lot. Very good. All righty. Well, come on up and play something sometime here in Auckland. We'd love to see you. Yeah, thank you. Well, if I do play, I'll let you know. All right. And thanks for taking time to talk to me. Thank you. Cheers. Right. See you. Bye-bye.